Hello, my name is Dave Coker. Welcome to the panel discussion for the Portfolio Theory Case Study. We're going to have a really good discussion with, my, with the help of my panel mates here, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, Jan? Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Jan Renman. I'm based in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. I started in the 80s uh, working as controller, finance director in various uh, companies. In the 90s, I became CFO in a fairly large public company and then moved to Accenture in 96, where I've continued on the sort of finance path, but in a different way of working. Hello, my name is Marius von Jarsvold. I'm a partner in Deloitte CIS. I'm based in Moscow. Um, I'm focusing on business transformation for large companies, um, focusing mostly on multinationals. Uh, previous to working in Moscow, uh, I've been with Deloitte in South Africa. Uh, we've done some work in the Middle East for an extensive period of time, as well as in the USA. Dave, what are we talking about? Ah, we're talking about portfolio theory this afternoon. And we have a really interesting case study that, we've, that I hope you've had a chance to go through. And as you know from your studies, modern portfolio theory is the idea pioneered by Markowitz back in 52, that by adding uh, investments to our portfolio, we can lower the specific risk of our portfolio and, and lower it down to a systemic level. And it's, it's very intuitively appealing, but it's based upon several assumptions, some of which are a little questionable. First of all, uh, one of the assumptions is that the markets are efficient. And that's something that we teach in business school, that the idea of efficient markets. But I think we know, and we'll go into the panel discussion, there are some, some uh, very, very valid questions about this idea of efficient markets. The other, the other assumption that this MPT is based on is that investors are rational. And I think we know that investors aren't really rational all the time, if, if, if any time, because we do see uh, asset bubbles from time to time. And the third problem, that we're, a third assumption that MPT or modern portfolio theory is based on is this idea that returns uh, follow what's called a Gaussian normal distribution or the bell curve. And as you can see, these assumptions are somewhat questionable. They're somewhat shaky. Now, when we start to look at some of the wealthiest investors, the most successful investors, I think you'll see that they didn't follow these ideas of modern portfolio theory, and they did something completely different. So let's look at, look at the, the possible, prob, possible solutions to a problem that you've been given, a very welcome problem. You have $20 billion to invest, and how are you going to go about uh, investing those assets? Do you perhaps invest, do you diversify to the max, investing no more than 2.5% of your equity, your capital, into a single investment, there's pluses and minuses associated with that uh, alternative. Do you perhaps uh, uh, choose a manageable number, maybe six or 12 investments? Do you put your money, your, your 20 billion, do you divide it up among six or 12 investments? Or perhaps do you d just give up with the idea of diversification totally and have one investment? So, gentlemen, what do you think? What, would be the, <laughs> what about these alternatives? <laughs> Dave, you know, I, I always wonder, you know, the, these, these clever guys, if they would have lived now, you know, in the life of Twitter and, and CNN and Bloomsburg, that is this information that's online available, whether they, you know, with their brain capacity, whether they would have changed their theories, theory somewhat. You know, the, the idea of 2.5% in each investment, um, I think 20 years ago it would give anyone the shivers. Um, but if you, if you look at it now... Um, you know, you've, you've got all these instruments that you can use, all this information at, the, at your fingertips that you can use of managing, these, of, these, of managing these investments. In addition to that, as well as, you know, 20 years ago, you had basically um, most probably the dollar, the pound, Deutsche Mark um, to, to compete with. Now you've got a myriad of, 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 of exchange rates that you also need to take into consideration and these constant flux and movement around those. So, so I would, I would, I would, you know, I would feel much comfortable taking two point five percent, put them in in, in in different different investments, different currencies, different markets, and use technology to to, to manage them on an ongoing basis. Understood. Yeah, good one. Because technology is really yeah. key. Because yeah. if you put two and a half percent of twenty billion, you end up right. with an incredibly large number of distinct investments. Correct. Correct. Very you good. have to online monitor. Mm -hmm. Twenty billion. I'll take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that, that's the problem uh, Peter Lynch ran into with the Magellan Fund. He scaled up so large, got to be so big, eventually it became unmanageable. But, you, but you're absolutely correct. He didn't have the technology. He was doing it with a bunch of, uh, mm. uh, originally they were highly paid investment analysts, and then as he had to hire, hire more and more of these people, they became graduate students, <laughs> more or less, and investment returns suffered. I, I think the, uh, the, the sort of underlying theory here made a lot of sense when it was published and... and and, and 
sort of uh, used uh, as the foundation for how to treat investments. But but a lot of th things have changed, as, as you said, Maurice. They, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, the, the markets are so much different, uh, and and uh, just what's happened in the last ten years about technology, uh, the all different types of financial instruments, uh, different types of investment you can uh, you can do, and and the pace of change. Uh, uh, impacts this a lot. So uh, yes, there may be uh, parts of, 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 of the theory that may be applicable, but, but sort of strictly using it, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with, uh, with that. Excellent point, Jan, because it is a different world, right? I mean, I mean, Markowitz never foresaw the flash crash. No. A thousand points in the Dow in what thirty minutes went right in the toilet. Never could have predicted that. Mm. And the markets are so connected these days as well. Uh, retail investors have access to commodities. They never could invest in commodities before. Okay. That was something rich people did. Mm. Now retail investors can purchase silver, purchase gold versus oil, pretty much any commodity you'd want. And those options weren't, they weren't there, as you said, uh, before. So there's, it's a very complex mix now. And it's really interesting to see if Markowitz theory scales up. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the effort, the effort of, of, of making the decision around, around the management of your portfolio is not, not, not necessarily around managing the portfolio on the longer term, but to decide which of these myriad of instruments that you've got available, which should you, which should you use. So you're arguing, I, I believe, don't let me put words in your mouth, against the idea of, of this concentration risk, the single Co point. Correct. Correct. But, but it worked for Warren Buffett. It worked for Bill Gates. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, but and? I think, yeah. yeah. And who else? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, taking Bill Gates uh, as an example, and there may be a few others, but, but uh, I think he has a good reason to stick. But well, I'm sure he's sort of diversified, but, but his main holding is within the company he founded. Uh, so I mm -hmm. think it, it's a lot about that. He started and, uh, and built a big, big global company, uh, and of course he... He, uh, uh, he he'd, he'd like to stick with that uh, sort of holding because it's, it's, it's probably more than just an investment. It, 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 there are emotions within it as well. So, uh, so you're arguing it wasn't a rational investment decision? No, I don't think. No, I, no, I, I, I don't think it's a rational yeah. investment. He, he, has, he hasn't done bad, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm sure with, with the type of money he he. He has the wealth he has created. I'm sure he has some uh, some other investments, but maybe the main main pieces within uh, within Microsoft. So, what would you guys recommend then? What would be a reasonable number? You got the problem is you got 20 billion to invest. It's a wealth and problem. You can't abscond to the Caribbean or a, a regime that's hostile to U.S. or Western interests. It'd be nice to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So, what do you do with the money? How do you deploy it into the markets? Yeah, you you would you would diversify it. Uh, I, I I would uh, do less. I I would diversify, but probably. Somewhere between five and ten different distinct investments. investments. Yes, Correct. yes. Correct. I, I yeah. wouldn't put it in in just one. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's manageable, and and uh, uh, you you can sort of uh, you, you well you can manage the type of investment, Understood. and I think you can oversee the risk and the upside. Uh, even yeah. so, if we're talking ten, that's that's it's a reasonable number. It's in, it's good, but we're still talking huge investments, right? Yes. Two billion at mm -hmm. a crack. There's not mm -hmm. too many two billion dollar companies out there that you can invest in without becoming a big. Uh, big no, big I company. I don't think they all. They, I don't think they have been sort of have to be equal size. You can put five in one and, and ah. five sort of <laughs> point five in another one. So it's, but it's just a matter of diversification, I think. But. Uh, I think also, I mean, there, there are a number of things you have to consider. It's 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 the sort of the, the balance of risk and the in, and the upside you, you you're after. Uh, having a lot of investments uh, is also uh, it may be the the currency risk you have to include. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a trading cost as well, and, and the pure manageability of, of, of the whole thing. Exactly. Um, but it's. Um, I mean, in, in addition to that, I also think you know you need to you need to have a plan of of, of what do you want to get out of your investment. You know, so 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 in the, the different categories of you know your your short term investments, perhaps a little bit more higher risk, a uh, little bit more higher return, but you can you can convert that quite quickly. Where you might have some investments that is a 10, 20 year investment, um, and that you would see you know perhaps a, a slower growth, but it is much more a, a longer longer period. It's interesting you mentioned that. Um, my first boss on a, on a trading desk in New York uh, uh, in, in the uh, late 80s actually said, "Trade your pl uh, plan your trade, then trade your plan. Correct. And so mm. many people don't have an exit strategy. They put the money in, and they say, when are you going to sell? 
from right. Right. And, and, right. and certain investments, you, 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 you may be locked in for, for a certain time. You, you can't sell it. Uh, yeah. It depends on what it is. It, it may be not sort of tradable. For exactly. Certain, well, that's a good certain, point because lock-in comes different ways. It yes. could be Ill lack of liquidity. Liquidity drives exactly. up. Right. So, so that can also be part of your your sort of investment strategy. You have some that 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 are liquid. Uh, you mm -hmm. can trade them, and, and other ones are, are more sort of long-term investments. It may be sort of pre-IPO type of uh, investments you do. Understood. So, I had a client that was quite heavily involved in in the renting of cranes in Dubai. Um, and at one stage, I mean, that was a very lucrative business. And then at one stage, he told me, you know, he's getting out of this now. I said, why? He said, because he just feel, his gut tell him that this is not going to continue. And he got out sort of middle 2007. Perhaps he lost a few. He could have made a few more. Mm -hmm. But um, he got out at the right time. Oh, yeah, and I yeah. think that's the, 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 the gut that you need to trust. Yeah, the smart around, guys around always, managing these things. Oh. Yes, yes, sir. The smart guys always leave money on the table. They don't Correct. go right up exactly. to the peak, but they <laughs> just, they check out early enough and they made their money. Correct. Right. They got out. And of course, the problem with all these things, you know, Markowitz theory or even the derivatives or part of the models that came after, is that they're all looking data that looks back, mm. and they're all based on assumptions. And we saw that with the credit crunch when all the correlations, all the asset classes, went to unity, went to plus one. Uh, you know, everybody was rushing for the exits. And nobody could get out, and people lost their shirts. If you mm. sold, you know, uh, assets that were relatively overpriced into a declining market, you had tremendous problems. So, but it, and it's also, I think, also your exposure or what you what you know drive a lot of your decisions. I've got an interesting example. One of my people working for me in Moscow, um, when the when the credit crunch started, now in Moscow it went quite quickly, or in Russia it went quite quickly in September October two thousand and eight. And he came with a brand new car. <laughs> and I said, so why did you buy a car? He said, this is his investment. He took all his money and he put it in a car. Now, for Excellent. any one of us, that would have been not a very clever investment. Yeah. And we had this discussion and he told me, he said, you know, with the previous crash that they experienced in, in Russia, um, you know, the one day he had 10,000 uh, rubles and then the bank tell, told him, now your 10,000 rubles is 500 rubles. And the best investment that they could take at that stage was something physical that they could sell again. And that is why his immediate reaction was, go and buy a car. Fantastic. Otherwise, the cars are typically not a good investment. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Very important to, to look at your environment that you are in when you make these kind of decisions. And playing in the global environment with $20, $20, $20 billion, um, that's, that's a much harder decision to make. Mm. So it seems, gentlemen, that we're almost suggesting that people look outside the box, that they don't really look, uh, when they do these investments, maybe they look to things that might be non-traditional, might be relatively illiquid, mm. but they might maintain their value in extreme circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the other thing we, we also conclude that the uh, sort of old school theory is perhaps not uh, fully applicable these days That's with right. the kind of markets we, we are, the type of investments you can do compared to then. Uh, and, and all of that. So I, I think there are m many more considerations these days when, when you do invest. Uh, uh, personally, I still believe in some sort of, of, of diversification. Yeah. Uh, um, but it, uh, on the other hand, you, you kind of have need to, to be able to manage it. Uh, so my, my beliefs are you, you, the old school theories is a basic foundation. You need to have that foundation and then you need to build on top of that. And you need to take all these variables that you want to work with, you need to put that on top of that to come up with your personal investment plan on how you think it should happen, given, given the environment that you're working in. Understood. So, so there you go. Lots of good ideas from the panel. It seems that we, we talked about and we, we agreed that diversification is good. Uh, and, and we had some insight that maybe we could do the 2.5% of our capital into distinct investments. There's a lot of different opportunities out there these days. And maybe Markowitz paper needs to be revisited, as our colleagues pointed out, uh, for the modern age. So once again, my name is Dave Coker. Thank you very much.